understand that Carolyn Ferrell is a rather well-renowned authoress. She is the author of a book called Dear Miss Metropolitan, which was recently shortlisted for the Penn Hemingway Award for a debut novel. And this is quite an extraordinary achievement, frankly. Her first book was a short story collection, Don't Erase Me, and was awarded in 1997 the Art Seinbaum Award for First Fiction of the Los Angeles Times Book Prize. A number of other rather impressive um, awards have been given to, to Carolyn. Uh, stories and essays have been anthologized in the Best American Short Stories of 2020 and 2018, Best Short Stories by Black Writers, etc. A number of very impressive, impressive achievements. Wonderful, Carolyn. But the most important, perhaps, achievement is that Carolyn is Elkie Booth's daughter. So for anyone who knows Elkie, her, her, her pride in her daughter has to be extraordinary on this very exciting day. So Elkie, we're glad that she's with us. And certainly Carolyn, again, who is on the faculty at St. Lawrence College. Um, she's been a faculty member in, 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 at St. Lawrence since 1996, lives in New York, which is near Elkie, which is wonderful for you, Elkie with her husband and children. Carolyn has agreed, by the way, to stick around after our closing words, and we will have a Q&A. So hold on to your ideas and thoughts until after. Carolyn, I'm gonna sign off, it's all yours. Thank you so much, uh, Joan, for that uh, wonderful um, introduction. Uh, I'm just gonna set a timer because I know that I will go over my time and I don't wanna do that. Um, so if you hear a loud noise, it's just my phone. Um, thank you all so much. I just have to make one correction to the introduction. I'm actually a faculty at Sarah Lawrence, not St. Lawrence. Um, if I were at St. Lawrence, it would be a huge commute <laughs> to my mom. So I'm actually at Sarah Lawrence. I've been there since 96. I'm a Sarah Lawrence graduate. Uh, my husband teaches at Sarah Lawrence Psychology, and uh, both of my kids went to Sarah Lawrence's Early Childhood Center. So we're a Sarah Lawrence family, and my daughter is presently a Sarah Lawrence sophomore. So we're a big Sarah Lawrence family. Um, I want to thank you all. Um, uh, Patricia, uh, Richard, and everyone else who was responsible for inviting me here today. I'm deeply honored uh, to be here. The last time I was here, I was actually there in person. And that was when my stepfather, Larry, was playing, uh, as it so happens, what a beautiful coincidence, was playing a musical accompaniment to a lecture on Langston Hughes. And um, it was quite beautiful. Um, listening to, uh, to Ella Fitzgerald, of course, bringing Larry back into my mind. Uh, he was one of my most steadfast cheerleaders. Um, Larry influenced me in many, many ways as a human being, uh, as a person. Um, uh, uh, Larry was a role model, a role model of empathy and um, great integrity. Um, as a musician, he really helped me think about the connection between musicality and writing. Um, so I owe a tremendous, uh, a tremendous debt to him. And um, I'm just so happy to, to bring Larry into the room uh, today. What I'd like to do is uh, the, the title of my talk is Transforming Life into Art, the Sources of Inspiration for my novel. Um, I'd like to read something that I wrote and then I'd like to just talk in larger terms about um, the way my novel came into being. Um, and uh, then of course, afterwards uh, when we meet, I'm happy to answer any individual questions. Um, as I mentioned in my introduction, the first thing I'm usually asked uh, during interviews or, you know, once Dear Miss Metropolitan was published, the first thing I'm usually asked is, um, is this a true life story? You know, I, I get different versions of it. Is it a true life story? Uh, did you base this on the Ariel Castro kidnappings that happened in Cleveland? Um, uh, what, you know, how much research did you do? So those are pretty much the three questions that I'm asked. And um, I love engaging with those questions because they sort of lead me to the, the theme that you have uh, provided for your ethical culture um, 
uh, uh, discussions, and that is our journey. You know, thinking about my journey with the book and ultimately what I see the, you know, what I'd hope the book would achieve in the world. So before I get started with that, I just wanted to read a, a, a tiny, tiny bit from the book. And it's actually um, the very opening. Um, this book is made up of many different sorts of things. It's not as if you've opened it, you'll see it's not a traditional linear narrative. And I'll talk more about that in a little bit. It's a book that is composed of different kinds of fragments. There's a narrative, a straight narrative that goes through. I think it's a straight narrative. Uh, there are interviews, there are photographs. There are all sorts of documentation in the book. And the first thing that I start off with is a, a draft of an article by a, uh, an intern who was trying to publish something in a local newspaper, the Queens Metropolitan. So this is the draft. Um, the pre preliminary draft, I should say, special weekend feature, they would not let go, January 1, 2008. Read this story, crossed out, open these pages, and you may feel sickened by the cruelties mentioned herein. Three girls are kidnapped and held hostage in a dilapidated house in the New York City borough of Queens. They become known as the victim girls. Their captor, a man described in vague terms by all the prominent news outlets, locks the girl aw girls away in chains, ropes, and other cruel, slash cruel, and other devices, including thumbtacks and carpet nails. In his world, a paperclip can be as unholy as an iron maiden. Kidnapped victims can abound in a city like ours. Cut. Though each girl is abducted at different points, the aggregate period of confinement is 10 years, during which, during which time crimes such as rape, asphyxiation, and verbal degradation, and general uh, torture occur with frequency. A number of pregnancies are said to have resulted from the sexual assaults, though to the best knowledge of the forensic detectives assigned the case, only one pregnancy is carried to term. At the time of the rescue, one of the girls is not accounted for, leading investigators to suspect the worst. Currently, this veritable house of horrors has been left to its own volition. Local politicians continually ask to have the place raised or repurposed. Thus far, no one city agency has stepped up to meet this challenge. When asked, the residents of this leafy, somewhat cigarette strewn cross out of this leafy, neighborhood hovering between Sutphin Boulevard to the west and Linden Boulevard cross out Rockaway Boulevard to the south have no real idea how to move forward. It appears they are in st still in some shape, state of shock and culpability cross out. No one claims to have suspected a thing. Several weeks after the fact, the people of Amity Lane remain at a loss as to how such a criminal mastermind could have lived right under their noses the whole time. Research done by Amina Whitehead Mensa, Queens Metropolitan staff intern. Um, so I wanted to read that book to kind of give you a brief summary of what it's about. Um, and also to explain that uh, one of my strategies in putting that summary at the very beginning of the book was that I was really not interested in telling the book, uh, telling the story as a story of, um, as a linear story, that is. I was not interested in doing that. I was interested in telling a story that really involved community. And I'll explain a little bit more about that in a minute. Um, when I first started writing this book, I wrote it as a linear narrative. Um, and I had many, many uh, um, inspirations. I did indeed think about the Ariel Castro case, which had happened uh, shortly uh, or had come to light shortly after I'd begun writing. Um, but I'd also been thinking about fairy tales and Dear Miss Metropolitan actually began as a series of fairy tales. Um, when I heard the news of the Ariel Castro case in which uh, three young girls were captive, uh, were held captive in his house for 10 years uh, and then, you know, were freed. Uh, I was just astounded as the rest of the world. Um, and I immediately began to think about how this real life case would come together with my thoughts on fairy tales. Um, and so that was 
the beginning of Dear Miss Metropolitan. Um, the first fairy tale I'd actually thought about writing was Goldilocks. Um, in particular, I thought of revising the story of the girl who allows her curiosity to pull her forward, hoping for the best, but experiencing the worst. Around that time, in, in addition to the story of Ariel Castro in the news, there was another uh, pretty gripping and awful story of a woman in Austria who had been held uh, captive for 27 years in a basement. Um, and like everyone else in the world, I was really caught up in these stories. They stunned me, they devastated me. But the question that kind of ran through my mind was, how could these people, these girls in particular, go missing for so long? How could they have survived such torment? Um, why wasn't, excuse me, why wasn't the world looking for them? Why weren't their families looking for them? Had their families looked for them? You know, um, so all of these questions kind of ran through my mind. And along with the rest of the world, I was very happy when the, the stories of liberation came out, the liberation of the girls who had been captured by Ariel Castro, the story in, um, in Austria. Um, and I, I was really, I was, I was greatly touched, but I felt drawn as a writer to these stories and um, to contribute my own, my own bit of, I don't know, my own voice to the stories, if I, if I can say that. Because while I was happy for these stories of victory, I was also really haunted by these stories, you know? And I thought about things like, well, what happens next? You know, the girls are rescued. Um, you know, uh, uh, how do they go back into the world? How do they, um, how do they forgive their communities? Uh, do their communities even feel guilty? Um, so I began to unpack a lot of things in thinking about the aftermath of their stories. Um, all of the events had to be unpacked and they had to be, for me, investigated in a larger context. And that's what really propelled me forward with Dear Miss Metropolitan. So again, the question that I immediately thought of at the liberation of these women was, you know, how could they, how could they be overlooked? How could they be misplaced? How could they be forgotten? Um, what, where was the national outrage? That was something else that really kind of got to me in particular with the Ariel Castro case, um, because uh, uh, I thought about the people who are disappeared in the world, in the world, in the media, um, who gets attention. And unfortunately with this last big case of Gabby Petito on Long Island, um, you know, it was quite horrible that she was discovered dead and, um, you know, uh, it was just a horrible story. But what that case also brought up was the fact that black and brown girls um, never get the same sort of attention. Um, and I was really curious about this. Um, when I began Dear Miss Metropolitan, however, I wasn't really interested in statistics. Um, I did not set out to write a true crime story. And that was really, really important to me. Something that I often tell my students um, at Sarah Lawrence, uh, as fiction writers, I say, real life is our enemy. And they always laugh at that. And they're like, well, how could real life be our enemy? Um, but for me, I, it's, it's an overstatement. Real life really isn't our enemy. But I do think about the ways when you tell a true crime story, you are really beholden to what the actual events. And for me, I couldn't do that. I could not write about the Ariel Castro women um, because I didn't feel it was my place. I'm not a reporter. I'm not a journalist. Um, I did feel, however, that fiction would allow me the space I needed to tell a story similar to theirs. So when I'm asked in interviews, uh, you know, uh, is this based on Ariel Castro? I have to say it's inspired by it. It's not based on it. You know, these the three women that I write about, Fern, Gwenny, and Jesenia, are made up. And they have, again, different sources. They have sources in autobiography. They have sources in true crime, they have sources in fairy tales, they have sources in a lot of things. So um, that was how I thought I would get into this uh, material. And it was also how I would tell a story that for me really focused on reclaiming humanity of those who had been um, 
typically seen as dispensable, not really uh, worthy of news attention. In other words, black and brown girls. Um, so that was really my impetus. Um, fiction has always allowed me the freedom to pursue stories that intrigue me, whether they're stories ripped from the headlines, and I've done that before in other uh, uh, works of fiction, of fiction, or those that are based in family lore. My imagination liberates my own work. It allows me the room to explore my subject matter in ways that yield for me the most meaning. And while Dear Miss Metropolitan is not based on real people, it was inspired by the strength and fortitude of actual young women who never gave up despite having endured violent torture and abuse. So when I first began to, you know, coming back to the, what I opened with today, when I first began writing Dear Miss Metropolitan, I asked myself, okay, what kind of story am I, am I going to tell? And my immediate answer, without really thinking too much through it, well, I'm going to tell the story of the girls' uh, uh, beginning, middle, and end. So the beginning, their lives, uh, the middle, where they are captured, and the end where they are liberated. Because I thought that's a typical narrative arc. You know, we want to have a beginning, middle, and end. We want to have the ending of liberation. So that is indeed what I did. I sat down and I wrote a book that uh, did not have that beginning uh, uh, passage that I just read to you, but just told the story of three girls who'd come from what we used to call broken homes, you know, homes that were various degrees um, very difficult for them. Um, they were captured by a man called Boss Man. Uh, they were, you know, held captive and tortured in his house. And then at one point, they are able to break free. So that was the end of my book. And I got to the end, I'd written about 100 pages. And I just thought, this was not enough. This is, first of all, it's novels are usually not 100 pages. Um, so something is missing. And I had to really think about it for a while. And what occurred to me was that um, I was missing the voices of the girls. And I was missing the voice of the thing that I found most important actually in the book, and that was the community. You know, community um, is what really provides and restores humanity in this case, in Dear Miss Metropolitan. And I realized I had to get the girls' voices in there. I had to also get the community's voice in there uh, in various aspects. So the titular character, Miss Metropolitan, she's actually an advice columnist for the newspaper Queens Metropolitan, which is of course made up. Um, and she lives across the street from the house where the girls have been held captive. And when they are liberated, she is at first overjoyed with everyone. Oh, thank goodness, the girls are, are freed. But slowly, she starts to, starts to develop a kind of survivor's guilt, um, as in, how did I not know that they were there? Um, I've seen kind of weird things happen at that house. How did I not know? And that kind of morphs into, what is my actual responsibility to these girls? And she is really in the grip of this guilt. Um, uh, it affects other people in the community as well. Um, and no one can, well, they, at first they can't really come to terms with it, but they learn in different ways um, to accept their responsibility and to think about um, not only their humanity, but the humanity of the girls. The girls had been seen as dispensable, you know, easily to forget, you know, they were troublemakers, runaways, um, but, actually they're human beings um, and they deserve the same kind of treatment as anyone else. So um, I really put a lot of time into thinking in this fictional context about the personal and societal factors that figured into their disappearance and recovery. Um, and again, I thought a lot about what their, sorry for that rustling, what their communities did for them. Um, I also thought about the community that these girls created on their own while in captivity. And that is really what pushed me to expand the book. Um, it, it's sort of like if I think about the book, uh, their story, the story that I had originally started with was this object. And then all of these tentacles kind of came out, the tent, one reaching towards the community, one reaching even towards their captor, one reaching towards their families uh, who had abandoned them, uh, one reaching towards um, the larger world. You know, these girls become sort of tabloid creatures and 
uh, uh, they don't want to be seen that way. They want to be seen as when they emerge, they're actually young women. They want to be seen as human beings. Um, uh, so these tentacles kind of go out into all places. And what that created for me was a kind of um, narrative fragmentation. So if you open the book, you'll see that it is, you know, again, there's a trajectory that goes throughout a, a larger trajectory, but the book is in fragments, it's told in fragments, it's told, it's told in documents, it's told in interviews, newspaper articles, letters, um, all sorts of things, dreams, uh, fairy tales, there are all sorts of pieces that go together. And again, this was the way um, that I felt I could tell the larger story of the girl's humanity. I could really humanize them. They wouldn't just be kidnapped victims. They would be um, human beings worthy of empathy. Um, and more important for me, they would be brown girls, black girls who were worthy of empathy, you know. Um, now, one of the writers that I uh, mentioned in my uh, in my uh, 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 in my description, I'm sorry for this talk, is Janet Frame, um, the New Zealand writer Janet Frame, uh, who wrote an amazing um, autobiography uh, made up in three parts. Um, you might all know An Angel at My Table, which was made into a film by Jane Campion. Um, it's just an amazing, amazing book. Uh, which is really, uh, you know, you learn about her life as a writer, but you, it's also a book on writing. You learn how to write through reading this autobiography. And one of the things that, uh, when I read it many years ago, that really stuck with me was the, the idea of using real life in fiction. And Janet Frame, she has this place, uh, which I mentioned called Mirror City, and she based it on a city in Spain when she was visiting there. She didn't travel very much in her life. She was pretty much a recluse in um, New Zealand, but she did take one European journey. And uh, she's in Spain. She looks out over a sea uh, or a lake or a sea, I can't remember. And she sees a city mirrored into that water. And uh, she calls it near a city. And that's the place where you take real life events and you transform them into fiction. And I just love that idea. You know, again, fiction really gives me the freedom to do what I want with my subject matter um, uh, uh, without thinking, okay, it didn't really happen like this in real life. You know, uh, 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 I have to think about real life. The real life analog sort of disappeared. And going to Mirror City, where I take not only events from the news, but events from my own life and transform them into art is really a necessary journey. Um, so Janet Frame was a tremendous influence with me. I also thought a lot about the work of Toni Morrison and its expansiveness and trying to, you know, Toni Morrison definitely approaches communities, you know, it's all about communities and the community's response to the individual. Um, I thought about Edward P. Jones, another writer I love, um, who in his story collections and in his novel, The Known World, which won the Pulitzer Prize some years ago, his story collections, uh, he's been likened to James Joyce, uh, uh, the author of Dubliners. So what James Joyce did for Dubliners, Edward P. Jones does for Black Washington. You know, when you read Edward P. Jones' work, you know everything about that, those various communities in Black Washington. Um, you know what's been lost and what's been gained. And so these writers, um, they were all tremendously important to me in putting forth um, Dear Miss Metropolitan. Sorry, I just want to check how I'm doing on time. Uh oh, I'm coming close to the end of my time. Sorry. All right. So, um, I just want to see, just make sure that I get everything in here that I wanted to. Um... Carolyn, you can take a few extra minutes. It's really okay. All right. I don't. I definitely don't want to go over because I know what it, that's like being on the uh, uh, being on the receiving end of someone who goes over. I guess I, you know, just to recap, um, you know, again, for me, uh, if I think about reclaiming humanity. Um, these girls, uh, Fern, Jenny, uh, Jesenia, and Gwynny, uh, they were really 
they were not symbols. They were actual human beings. I did not want them to be symbolic. And in fact, in their lives in the book, they fight against being symbols. They don't want to be the strong, you know, uh, uh, black women who are there. They are strong black women, but they're more than that. They're actual human beings deserving of empathy. Um, I chose again to use a sort of fragmented uh, uh, narrative to tell a story that would encompass as much as possible, including the voices of the community, the voices of the family, the voices of the girls. I even have, you know, as I, I mentioned briefly, I have something in here uh, from the point of view of the captor, boss man uh, is his name. And um, it wasn't because I wanted to redeem him necessarily, but I wanted to make sure that his character had dimension. And so in order to do that, I had to give a little bit of his background of abuse um, as an abuse victim. So um, yeah, I, I, uh, I really wanted to capture the fullness of the girl's experience. And for me, the only way to do that was with this fragmented narrative. Oops, sorry, that was my alarm. Um, now it's interesting. Uh, this morning, I happened to be uh, looking at an interview. Um, tomorrow night, I'm going to the Penn Hemingway uh, Awards uh, uh, event at Town Hall. And uh, one of the judges, uh, Taya Obrecht, she's a Yugoslavian American um, author, uh, The Tiger's Wife, amazing, amazing writer. She was, I was just watching an interview with her this morning where she talked about the necessity of fusing the magical with the real, which also occurs in my novel. And she said something that I thought was so important. And I think I'll leave with this uh, last note. She said, myth-making is something people do in strife. In our reality, fantasy comes as a coping mechanism. So there are moments where the novel takes flight into fantasy. Uh, there are moments where the novel is actually really, I think, really funny. Um, one of my colleagues mentioned that uh, he's never read that many mentions of Judge Judy in his life in a book. Um, uh, and the reason, again, is that, you know, how do, how do we cope? How do we cope? How do we come, become more human? How do we become uh, more empathetic? Uh, it's through storytelling. It's through myth-making. It's through a combination of all of these things. So with that said, thank you for listening. <laughs>